Well, about session, uh, about team, uh, it is technology and uh, groundwater. We have been discussing uh, about uh, that already uh, yesterday. It was a great session. And today we are going to continue. Uh, we have uh, three excellent presentations and uh, very, very diverse presentations. So we will cover a number of topics, technology, IDC, climate change, and uh, we will have a general uh, discussion. So I will not really go into details uh, before uh, giving floor to uh, three speakers, but I will just uh, read some uh, uh, housekeeping instructions. And uh, so it is about questions. You are invited to um, uh, submit these questions in QA using QA button. And you can find this button at the bottom of your screen. We will address your questions. Uh, during uh, the talk, I think that yesterday uh, Enrique and uh, presenters uh, answered 60, 65 questions uh, already during the, the session. And uh, you will only see uh, each question once it is answered, either verbally or in writing. So uh, as we have a huge audience, uh, if we don't have a time to answer all the questions we receive, uh, we will aim to collect written responses from the presenters to place on the conference website. Please note that the chat box is disabled during session. However, uh, keep an eye keep an eye on, on, on it because some useful messages messages can be can appear appear there. And uh, last but not least, if you experience any technical problem, please Google. Zoom Help Center uh, or send a mail to online conference, online .conference at uh, iwa.org for assistance. So those were the, uh, the housekeeping rules. As I said, we will have uh, three very diverse uh, presentations and uh, uh, Enrique is going to look at, at, the, at the questions. And uh, first, uh, we, will, we will start uh, with a presentation uh, given by uh, Ben. Ben is going to kick off. And uh, Ben is going to tell us uh, an interesting story about a very challenging uh, issue, and that is time, uh, time, space, connecting surface water and groundwater, and link with the uh, decision support uh, system. So. Uh, Ben, uh, you, are, you are around and the uh, um, floor is yours. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Great, thank you, Nino, and, and hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, I'm, I'm joining you today from uh, Victoria, BC, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, today, I look forward to presenting uh, to you some work that we've been uh, doing over the past several years on methods to connect the impacts of groundwater pumping on stream flow. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so stream flow depletion uh, occurs when, when groundwater is pumped from the ground. Uh, initial, initial pumped water is uh, preferentially sourced from reductions in storage, and then over time, uh, more of that water uh, is sourced either um, uh, from intercepting uh, groundwater that would otherwise discharge into streams, or in some cases, uh, inducing infiltration from the stream into the aquifer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there's there's a range of different approaches <clears throat> uh, with uh, increasing levels of complexity and increasing levels of implied accuracy uh, to assess the magnitude and location of uh, stream flow depletion. So uh, so at the at the basic level, uh, there's there's an expert guess, uh, which has uh, low implied accuracy, but is also uh, very easy to implement. Uh, the next step beyond that are uh, analytical methods of assessing stream flow depletion. So after Tice or uh, Glover, Balmer, uh, Hunt, there's a variety of methods that have uh, 
been developed over the past decades to uh, to, to complete analytical cal calculations uh, to assess stream flow depletion. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's uh, potential to use numerical models, uh, emerging opportunities uh, for statistical or machine learning approaches, and then uh, in some cases, it may be possible to uh, to assess stream flow depletion using physical observations, uh, observing uh, uh, temperature in the stream, uh, near near channel um, uh, variations in gradient, uh, those type of approaches. Uh, what I'm going to focus on today is is a new method that that we've developed, uh, which we've called analytical depletion functions, uh, which expand on the approach of the analytical models and introduce additional benefits in their ability to be able to be applied across large areas and uh, over large times. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the analytical depletion function has uh, three components. Uh, so the first component is a stream proximity criteria. Uh, this is based on the on the assumption that uh, over time, as pumping continues, the, the cone of depletion will extend and there'll be more streams impacted uh, by depletion from a given well. Uh, the second component is the, uh, the method to apportion that depletion to the local stream networks. So uh, there's a variety of methods to do that. Uh, the method that we found to perform the best was a, what we call a web, web squared method. Uh, which which extends radians out around around the well itself, and then uh, apportions depletion to those uh, points of intersection based on uh, an equation uh, incorporating the the square of the distance between the well and those locations. And then the third and third component is the selection of the analytical model used to uh, calculate the depletion. Uh, so in our testing, we've we've found that that the Hunt model uh, performs uh, optimally. Uh, next slide, please. So we've compared uh, uh, compared the performance of these analytical depletion functions in a number of settings uh, in British Columbia, uh, California, and and the western part of the U.S. Uh, we've compared we've completed these ca these comparisons against uncalibrated numerical models uh, against calibrated numerical models which were created for purposes other than assessing stream flow depletion. Uh, versus coupled surface water groundwater models and versus calibrated numeric models for uh, that are that are enshrined in uh, in policy and legislation for assessing stream flow depletion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the results of these comparisons uh, have led us to the conclusion that um, that in many cases these analytical depletion functions. Uh, provide similar estimates to more complex methods uh, with far greater uh, uh, requirements in terms of uh, model production, uh, lower requirements in terms of data, and also uh, lower computational costs. And that these, these functions are suitable for determining questions like uh, which stream will be the most affected by pumping at a given location, and what will the impact be on that stream. Uh, overall, we found that these methods perform best in flatter terrain and with wells that are reasonably close to streams, and that the, the performance uh, degrades uh, beyond that. But um, uh, in most cases, that's, that's where wells are pumping uh, in alluvial plains, and, uh, and it's the, the proximal wells that are, that are of greatest concern of, often for uh, conjunctive management. Uh, next question, please, or next slide. Uh, so the, the applications of these uh, functions, they're best suited for screening level evaluation of impacts from either uh, proposed new or existing well networks. Um, and their ability to implement, be implemented in decision support tools can amplify the benefits of the speed and simplicity and also the transparency in these calculations to stakeholders. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, my company, Foundry Spatial, uh, uh, delivers web-based decision support tools uh, through our Foundry Spatial Water Framework. Uh, over the past year, we've been working to translate the research results uh, and the, the new methods that we've developed uh, for the analytical depletion functions into our web-based decision framework uh, to provide pathways for people to understand uh, the, the interactions between surface and groundwater from a, a stream first perspective, 
uh, from a well perspective and from an aquifer perspective as well. Uh, so the stream first perspective will, uh, will provide information on the, what are all of the wells impacting the stream? Uh, what are the cumulative impact of all of those wells on stream flow? Uh, and then the well focused exploration is more about what are the potential impacts of a new well at this location or what streams is an existing well potentially impacting and how much. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an example of the results that are provided within the framework. Uh, so this is for uh, a single well evaluation. Uh, the black line represents the monthly pumping over time. And then the blue line superimposed uh, represents the total depletion associated from that well on all nearby streams. Uh, next slide. Uh, the real power of these methods uh, becomes apparent when you integrate this depletion assessment with estimation of stream flow in local streams as well. Uh, so this is, this is a, a presentation of initial results from an application of the analytical depletion functions in a, a, a small basin outside of Santa Rosa, California. Uh, it's, it's what's being shown on the chart, the, uh, the dark line with the, with the shaded gray uh, behind it uh, shows the, the monthly stream flow and the range of stream flow over the past 65 years. And then the three colored lines represent how much of that stream flow is being depleted from pumping groundwater in the basin. And that, that, uh, the three lines represent the, the magnitude from 1985, 2015, and 2045. So there's important insight that can be drawn from this for uh, water managers that are asked to, uh, to incorporate not just the impacts of direct withdrawals from surface, but also the impacts of, of uh, groundwater pumping on uh, water sustainability in a watershed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that uh, takes us to the end. I'd just like to, to wrap up by thanking my uh, co-authors on this, uh, this work, Dr. Tom Gleason at the University of Victoria, uh, Dr. Sam Zipper at the Kansas Geological Survey, uh, Dr. King uh, Lee at the University of Victoria, and uh, Dr. Sina Shabani at Boundary Spatial. And uh, I see I'm just under time, so thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to what, uh, what my other presenters on the panel uh, have to share. Ben, many thanks. Uh, this was an excellent presentation and uh, I, I really enjoy it, although uh, modeling is, is, is not really my thing. Uh, but I think uh, I even uh, uh, learned uh, something. And uh, Enrique, I, I, I don't see I don't see questions coming. Uh, you know, is it uh, that then uh, uh, this was too scientific for, <laughs> for a part of audience? I, I don't know, but um, it is it is a very challenging uh, issue. Uh, this. Uh, link uh, stream flow uh, depletion and uh, and how to tackle it and then to have that uh, in a, a decision support system so online um, it, it, it's really great uh, because what we usually see we see uh, information systems on groundwater or on the surface water and less on processing and certainly very little about processing this time uh, space uh, uh, interface between uh, these, these two. So, uh, you know, I promise you, I'm going to test this <laughs> and come up with some, some questions and, and serious questions. At least, oh, some, some questions are uh, coming, but uh, okay, we will, uh, uh, Enrique, shall we take it now uh, on or later on? As you prefer, Neno, but I think it's better at the end because we have five minutes left oh, for you and eight. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Okay. Let's let's move then. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, let's move then to gentlemen, which is which is called uh, uh, Michael, and uh, I think I, I know the gentleman from somewhere, and he's going to to uh, tell us something about. Uh, uh, really, really interesting topic, and that's uh, melting of glaciers and, and groundwater and managing aquifer charge. 
Uh, it is a hot topic. And uh, Michael, are you around? Yes, uh, I'm around. Oh, great. And, and knowing Michael, I'm going, I, I'm, I'm sure that Michael <laughs> is going to tell us also about some, some other very interesting things. So Michael, floor is yours, please, 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's, it's great to be here. I'm calling from the West Coast of the United States, Corvallis, Oregon. And um, this is going to be a little bit of a different talk in the sense that I'm not really going to present much. I'm actually going to would, would like some uh, advice from you. And I want to thank my co-author, Maria Gibson. This was a lot of her PhD work. And um, the only thing to note on that slide there is the um, waterwire.org because as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to post a copy of my short presentation, which I'm giving, and a longer presentation, which has more, you know, nuts and bolts in it than I can do in 10 minutes. So you might want to look at that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, this is the, um, uh, you can tell which one is Maria, and um, I'm the one up top there. This is essentially what we're going to be talking about. OK, uh, next slide. And you'll note um, my presentations are a lot different from from most people's in that I'm loaded down with URLs and websites. And that's the reason why I post these on my blog, because I don't expect people to be able to read everything in the short amount of time I have. And I actually can't see I can only see the lower quarter of my slides, so I'm not sure whose problem that is. Let me let me expand it a bit. So two, uh, okay. I can see a little bit more. Anyway, just some um, um, definitions here. And if you give me the next slide, please, Callum. Okay, and um, this is one of the things that managed aquifer recharge can do. And I've added something down in the bottom and that's we can increase groundwater resilience. So uh, next slide, you'll see that some of these slides don't have much information. This is essentially one way to do managed aquifer recharge, um, um, surface aquifer recharge into an unconfined aquifer. Next slide, please. And this is a little more complicated where we're using an injection well uh, for a confined aquifer. So these are like two basic uh, ways we can get water into the uh, subsurface. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, a magazine that uh, Maria and I edited a couple of years ago talking about managed aquifer recharge. Again, the URL down there. And these are short articles about managed aquifer recharge. They're not like technical papers that you'd find in a, in a journal. Next slide, please. You're going to get tired of hearing me say that. Here's another one. If you're familiar with the uh, International Water Association's Source magazine, um, we wrote an article a couple of years ago. This focused on some issues in California. And again, that URL will take you to that magazine. Next slide. You're probably wondering, ah, Copiapo, down here in Chile. This is where the idea came to me about 13 years ago. Uh, we were down there. Um, uh, giving talks on water conflict, good place to do that. This, of course, is in the Atacama Desert, one of the uh, driest spots in the world. And uh, the Copiapo River was uh, flowing at that time. And I was kind of amazed. And of course, the, the Chilean hydrologist who's showing us around said, well, we're getting, we're getting meltwater from the glaciers. Uh, but unfortunately, the glaciers are melting unsustainably. So it's not going to be like this for a while. So the old brain started clicking away and I said, gosh, maybe we could recharge some of that. And if you go to the next slide, okay. Um, I thought about high mountains in the world. And again, this was not done scientifically. Um, and in fact, so these are a list where there might be uh, glaciers that are melting unsustainably. Now, whether or not they need to have the water recharged is another issue, okay? Next slide, please. And all I did was go to, a map like this, in fact, this very map, and I looked at all the high mountain ranges, and I was actually surprised to find when I was in um, Iran a number of years ago, the Zagros Mountains have glaciers up there, and they're worried about um, their melting unsustainably. And so I just kind of picked these out, and I said, maybe we could go here, maybe we could go there. So next slide, please. And um, the next couple of, of um, uh, slides are essentially places, you know, newspaper articles, journal articles showing where things might be uh, 
uh, going south with, with respect to glaciers. This is from the Calgary Herald a couple of years ago about losing uh, uh, glaciers from the um, Canadian Rockies. Next slide, please. I believe is um, this is in uh, Bolivia showing problems that they're having running out of water or perhaps running out of water. Next slide, please. I believe this is uh, I believe this is China. I can't see the top of it, but it looks like it to me uh, in the Tibetan plateau. Next slide. Ah, OK, this is um, um, I think this is the one. Why don't you go to the next slide? Uh, there's a good one from um, melting glaciers in Europe. OK, and in fact, I reviewed a proposal for the Swiss National Fa Science Foundation a couple of years ago where uh, a researcher wanted to study this. Now, they weren't going to recharge it in the ground. They were going to try to build some some high elevation dams to store the water. So anyway, uh, next slide. OK, this is uh, what's happening just about 100 miles north of me. This is Mount Hood, which is um, um, east of Portland, Oregon. It's about 3,000 meters high. And that's one of the glaciers there, the White River Glacier. And what's happened in 100 years? It's going away. And that's what it, on the right is what it looks like now. want to thank Ann Nolan for that. And we'll go to the next slide. Aha, uh -huh. this is an interesting um, um, graph from the, the PhD dissertation of Ann Jefferson, who's now at Kent State University. And she was looking at the Mackenzie River, which is just down the road from me. It flows into the Willamette River, which flows into the Columbia River. And you got three graphs there. Uh, you got time on the bottom, and the left hand side is a proxy for uh, annual discharge. And you can see the, the two solid lines. The gray one is what was happening 50, 50 years ago. The black one was what was happening um, about 20 years ago. And the dash one is a simulation of what might happen in the year 2050. So we know that, and this is from um, early snowpack melting, not so much glaciers. So this is a little bit different, but what's happening is the, the, we're moving back in time. The peaks are coming earlier and that's gonna be a problem because we don't have the storage to hold on to them. We're gonna have more flooding perhaps in the winters in, in this part of the world. And so this is something that we need to deal with. So anyway, next one. So these are, these are just some of the issues that have to be addressed just about everything. And again, I want to emphasize that all those mountain ranges I talked about may not necessarily uh, be suitable for a variety of reasons. And, it, and for example, if, if you tell me, um, yeah, why don't you go to the, uh, you know, uh, Tianshan Mountains, or you want to go to Tajikistan or, or Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, and mess around with those rivers, I'll say, uh, I don't think so. Okay, so we'll go on from there. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so these are just some of the other uh, issues looking for suitable areas. Next slide. Baha. Okay. Um, Yakima Valley. Yakima Valley is up in Washington State. It's uh, about a five hour drive for me from here. And this is where Maria did a lot of her work. We were uh, funded by the state of Washington to look at this. And essentially, we were looking at taking some of the early snowpack. Um, or, or pardon me, the early snowmelt runoff in the Yakima River, which was not possible to have it being used because it came before the irrigation season and it didn't correspond with the trout season, or not trout season, the salmon season. So they were saying, could we store this water somewhere and then use it in June instead of early May? And that was the gist of the project. So let's go to the next slide. And, it, and again, the, the long, this is the uh, Yakima Basin. It's about 15,000 square kilometers. It, it's a tributary of the Columbia River, which is down there on the right-hand side. And so we looked at this, next slide, and we don't have much of the um, information here, OK? But we did identify some areas in the Columbia River basalts where we could store water. And we also had some surficial um, recharge areas into the alluvial material in the rivers. Uh, next slide. And this this is one of the papers that we produced. Um, that's uh, this is one of those open access journals. You can access it there. Next slide, please. And um, actually, um, this has nothing to do with the project. Um, this is this is the uh, Water King and uh, three of my favorite favorite sayings. 
You'll note the last one down there, I had to switch to the metric system or the SI system. And so it's not as dramatic to say 3.2 million, uh, you know, acre feet or whatever, 3.2 million. Anyway, my favorite saying is the one up top, the one in the middle there that was actually said at a Texas legislative hearing by one of our esteemed legislators who was annoyed at the results of a hydrologic report that was, you know, that not to his fitting. So let's go to the last slide. And um, a lot of people said I couldn't do 26 slides in 10 minutes. I think I'm maybe one minute over, Nino. Thank I see you're smiling there. Anyway, um, I'm going to post these and the other ones up. In, on my website. And so the, the longer one for you science geeks, that's the one you got to look at. So there, I'm done. Thank okay, you. Okay, Michael, Michael uh, many thanks. Many thanks for keeping your time and, and many thanks uh, for this uh, uh, excellent uh, and very interesting presentation uh, because, you know, it, it was, it was, Global, uh, you, you you went uh, to 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 many parts of the of the world, and uh, you you made us aware <laughs> once more that this is really a global uh, problem. Uh, yeah. I have trillion questions to you, but uh, I, we, we we need to to move on. And okay. uh, indeed, as Enrica said, let's keep it. Uh, for, uh, well, thank the you end. very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, now we have. Uh, 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 Truly, ICT application. Uh, it, it is uh, advanced uh, DSS, and it's very important. It's also open source, and I invite uh, our colleague uh, Yuli uh, to present uh, his work on on uh, uh, web-based uh, DSS. Uh, uh, Yuli, uh, the the floor is yours. Ten minutes. Okay. Thank you, Nano. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. In this presentation, I'd like to talk about how we can leverage environmental data and models with web-based decision support system, or DSS to be short. Next slide, please. So as scientists or engineers, we like modeling tools. They help us to digest different kinds of data and get distilled information to gain better understanding of our research program. And we believe that such benefits can also apply for the decision makers in their practice. That's why we are eager and proud to share those tools with our stakeholders saying, hey, here are the keys to solve your problem. Use them wisely. But the stakeholders may wonder which key and how wisely is that? So here you see the problem. We should not expose our stakeholders to the same complex tools that we use to. Next, please. So a way to adjust this is to turn our research tools into the DSS by tailoring those tools and give only the relevant key that fits the stakeholders. So here, I want to share some experience in developing a DSS using a case study from our groundwater management project in China. Next slide. So first, let me introduce our study region and the target user. The DSS that we are building is based on Guangzhou County in North China Plain, a region known as China's football, but also famous for its phenomenal overpumping issue. Farmers here practice double cropping. They grow summer maize and then winter wheat in a year. The total water demand of double crops, however, cannot be satisfied by the annual rainfall, which is around 500, uh, 500 to 50 millimeter. This leaves a demand gap that is mostly fulfilled by groundwater pumping. So a key to mitigate the overpumping situation here is to adjust the cropping pattern and to set up a proper pumping quota. And this is what the local government is doing by introducing winter wheat following subsidy and the quota-based pumping control. Next slide. Uh, for the target users, so the target user of this DSS are local water manager. Their main jobs are water planning and water fee collection. So these people have limited or even no experience in using GIS modeling tools, etc. So three design principles are born in our mind when implementing this DSS. The first principle is that uh, we consider the friendliness of the user interface. So fewer buttons and the intuitive visualization can help to avoid the users from getting lost. The second criterion is the easy maintainability, which means on one hand, once the project is over and we hand over the tools to the users, 
they should be able to continue use it and tackle potential issues themselves. But on the other hand, uh, the easy maintainability can facilitate the reuse of the DSS components for other projects in the future. Then the last criterion is the DSS uh, should make our uh, target user's life easier by automating data processing or assessment and of course, providing them with good decisions. Uh, no, one slide back, not, not yet, yeah. So with all those criteria in mind, we can start developing the DSS software, right? But building a software can be a formidable task due to other technical requirements, especially when building a web-based applications. This is why usually we hunt down some software engineers and make them to do the work for us. However, then we go to the next slide. It turns out that we can save some project funds by adopting free and open source software, which are very popular nowadays. So in our project, we identified a number of those open source software that allows us to make a nice web-based application without compromising the features. The main software that we use to develop this DSS app is R, which I'm sure that you have heard of or even used a lot in your research. And then Docker is a virtualization software. It makes your program portable and scalable. And then a few couple of other software that bring your DSS app online and the take advantage of cloud computing and the interactive visualizations. The entire framework allows us to pack the DSS program as well as its uh, configurations on a server together. So one can deploy it easily in most modern cloud environment like the Amazon web server. Users can access the DSS on the browser, just like visiting a normal web page. Then we had a paper that explained in details about this framework and the development workflow. Uh, in, the, in that paper, you can also find some links to the examples that you can download and play to play with for free. Next slide. So before I review our DSS in Flash, let me show you its uh, skeleton first. On the left, is the database, which is the brain of this DSS. It stores all the data that we have collected during the, Chinese, uh, the China's project, and it feeds corresponding inputs to the models. Then in the middle column are different uh, tools from top to bottom. The data portal is for visualizing the observation data. Then the crop mapper uh, uses Google Earth Engine to analyze remote sensing images for crop type identification. Then the irrigation calculator implements the crop model to estimate the crop water demand. Then we also have distributed and lumped groundwater model for simulating groundwater head distribution over time and space. And the groundwater models are updated periodically with data assimilation technique. And all those tools serve two purposes. One is for monitoring and one for the water quota planning respectively. Next. Now let's... Uh, let me show how this DSS look like and how it can help the local water manager to better manage the, water, uh, the groundwater. So this interface, as I mentioned before, is essentially a website with different tabs on the top corresponding to different modeling tools. So under the uh, water quota planning page that you are looking at now, on the, at the right side of, of the panel, users can choose the target groundwater depths as their groundwater management goal in the following year, and then specify the expected surface water supply. Then this DSS will trigger its computational routine to generate the suggestions about how much water can be pumped from the shallow aquifer given the specified targeted depths, and how much winter weed following is needed if necessary. Next. Okay, so now with the water quota obtained from this quota planning module, one can feed this information to the groundwater model to check the probable outcome regarding to the head distribution. Here, you can also uh, further adjust the boundary conditions like precipitation or modify the water or location setting at a township level. Next. Finally, for farmers who applied for the winter weed following subsidy, once this plan is car carried out, we can inspect their compliance using the land use map generated from the crop mapper. So in this way, managers only need to go to the fields if they've identified any suspicious plots. This can greatly reduce their labor effort. Next slide. 
Yeah. To conclude, uh, in this uh, talk, I show you how a DSS can consolidate our research tools to support the groundwater resource management. And we should also take into account the target user's characteristics when designing such a DSS in order to achieve a balance between the usability and the technicality. And co-design it with your stakeholder will be a good way to go. And last, the DSS as a software, its development will of course require other computing uh, skills, but the free and open source software nowadays provides us a cost-effective solution to achieve a modern and web-ready application in a cloud context. So now let's go to the last slides. With that, this concludes my presentation and I'd like to thank SDC for funding this project and our partners from China. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, very, very impressive and very practical. And again, I, I, I find this open source uh, capability uh, really important. Enrique, we don't have much time, but could you please come up at least uh, one or two questions? Yes, yeah, sure, very quickly. I have summarized some. There are some uh, eight for Ben, but I am going to launch only one. Ben, straight to the point. To what extent can the SFD model face up the stream water related phenomena in a climate change scenario? Of course, uh, floods and drought. There. <laughs> a minute a minute is probably enough time, not enough time to, to really get deep into that, but the um, so the the real benefit of this approach is the ability to apply it at, across large scales without a whole bunch of um, calibration on the the setup. So um, we can layer in things like climate change projections, the impact on surface water supply, the impact uh, potentially on variable uh, recharge uh, rates. Um, the and the benefit uh, similar to uh, to what uh, what you Lee just presented in terms of the simplicity and the and the ease of use for people to understand, that's that's a key component really, is that these are the science can be very complicated, but but in order to empower people to take action, it needs to be presented in a very simple way that they can engage with and understand the impacts of their decision. So that's that's a core focus for us as well too, and I, I echo his comments around that. Good reply. Thank you, Ben. Mike, please. Which are the environmental consequences of MAR with a snow melt and which are the advantages with traditional damming? The, um, well, with, with regard to um, traditional damming, um, the, the, first of all, if you build a dam and you have a reservoir, obviously you get the, all the multi-purpose um, aspects that a reservoir brings. What, but with MAR, you're just essentially getting storage. So, um, one of the things that you you avoid is you know all the land use problems with you know getting enough room uh, to have a dam. You and and in certain climates you may have evapor you know great evaporation losses and things like that. With with respect to I think you said in, environmental. Actually, what we're doing in the Yakima Basin was greeted with enthusiasm by the environmentalists as well as the irrigators because what they were going to do the environmentalists is they need to put more water in the stream during the summer when the salmon are spawning so they were going to get use of that water in the summer and then the irrigators were going to get you know use of the water because it was during the growing season so okay anyway yeah Thanks, thanks, uh, 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 Michael. And uh, well, I, I'm getting message uh, that we have to uh, round uh, uh, up. And uh, I, I just want to, to thank uh, uh, presenters one more and, uh, and technical support. And at the end to, to say that all remaining questions we will ask presenters to answer those. Uh, have a look at, at the posters as well, and the uh, PowerPoint presentations will be available at uh, IW at the conference uh, uh, website. We are uh, with this. We are completing uh, this second session of Team Three. Thank you for your attention. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.